Um, brother, Brother Committee You. Uh -huh. Now, what I want you to do is pronounce your name for us and, yes. and spell it. My name is pronounced phonetically, which is K-E-M-I-T-U, which is pronounced Committee U. And of course, Bay. All right. So, um, be dealing with this, uh, you know, Moorish you know, consciousness for 20 years or more. And um, I've been dealing, you know, with the system that we've been dealing with, you know, that's actually a stronghold and a stranglehold on our people. And um, I've been doing a lot of research and studies for that same period of time. So I learned a lot from um, two brothers, you know, who are now an ancestor. And of course I've learned from others over the years, but these two particular brothers is who really woke me up to, you know, how to deal with the system. And um, the brother is known, known as Noble Jawali. Yes. They call him Prophet Noble Jawali. And um, the interesting thing about him, uh, Minister Clemson Brown, is that it's like he's on, unheard of. You know, you'll hear Garvey, you'll hear Malcolm, you'll hear Elijah Muhammad, Daddy the Great, Father Divine and so forth, where you've been hearing, you know, these prominent brothers over the years. So you'll say to yourself, you know, well, what happened to the Prophet Nobu Ali? When, you know, why are we not hearing from him? Mm -hmm. And I used to wonder about that. And I did some research on that to find out why, because um, I learned that our people were Moors, not through the Moy Science Temple of America, um, I'm not a member, um, and the only reason why I'm not a member because there's just too much uh, diversity going on within the temple, um, and the purpose of that diversity was to destroy the works of what this brother was doing for us. All right, one of the main things that this brother was talking about is our nationality and our birthright as a people that was stolen, and you, you know, and it's interesting because when you start hearing Farrakhan. When you start hearing John Henry Clark and others, you know, Khalid Muhammad, you start hearing them talk about how our nationality was taken from us, our birthright, our language, our customs and the like. Our um, mores and folkways have been taken from us customarily. And so now it's been replaced with European folkways and moreways and, and of course the English language, you know, and of course French and, and other languages that they use to dominate our people. And um, one thing that I have learned is that language is the key, all right? Because within the language itself, it, it, it capsulates your culture. So whatever's in your culture, you express that through your language. So when they take the language from you, they take actually your culture, all right? So that's the vernacular that whatever you see, you express it through the language. And so because they don't, they have taken, you know, the European occupation through, um, uh, colonial warfare, which is still going on to this day, all right, but they're so sophisticated with it today that, and so subtle with it, you know, that we don't see it, all right. It's, it's an issue where, you know, we've been so poisoned with the language, mentally, physically, and spiritually in our soul, that we don't even realize what we're saying. I give you a good example. Because I study etymology, I study epistemology, I study law, I study uh, equity and, and finance. And because I went into that area because of these two brothers, you know, Noble Jawali and C.M. Bay, all right, these two brothers woke me up. You know, I started reading their literature, started studying it. Like, like I said earlier, I knew that we were Moors because I've read through Afrocentric studies for a period of 30 years. You know, like John G. Jackson, you know, the introduction of African civilization, civilization by John G. Jackson, the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams, George G.M. James, who wrote the book Stone and Legacy, and, and of course other books. So when you read these materials, all right, and these are materials that I have read where earlier before I have been certain about who came out with the Golden Nation of Moors, and then Jose Pimento Berry, The Most Children of Othello, you know, and other books that's been put out in reference to the Moors. But again, uh, 
30 years ago, I knew we were Moors, but not so much as you would say, being active. You know, saying because we, because our people were known by many different names, you know, which is something I'm aware of. You know, so I'm not a person that I would say that I'm stuck on saying that we were just Moors because the Moors evolved from ancient Kemet. You know, what I'm saying so when George E. and James in the book Stone Legacy on page 39 and 40, he says that the Moors were the custodians of the House of Kam. All right, this is the reason why the Moors had such elaborate textiles, mosaic pieces, and all kinds of. Uh, engineering uh, of, of irrigation of, uh, of horticulture and agriculture and you know and botany and mathematics and you know so all that was from Kemet that spilt over from Kemet but that was carried over from Kemet because when when Kemet was being invaded by an Arab invasion you know you know they they, they went you know to uh, 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 Central Africa from Central Africa to West Africa all right and from that point on the Moors who was invaded by those same invaders, those Moors took on that faith. But even though they took on the faith, brother, uh, uh, Minister Brown, they still held on to the Moorish, to, to the ancient Kemetic culture and customs. Well, let me ask you, um, what is the relationship between the ancient Kemetic people mm -hmm. and the Moors? Are they one and the same? They're one and the same. They're definitely one of the same. Now, it's interesting that you asked me that because by me studying with um, Brother Baba Haru, which is Samaj, mm -hmm. many, many years ago, um, you know, studying with Kemet 101 and 102, and of course, my own research and studies, you know, learning from Dr. Ben and others, and Sister Ricketti, you know, and others, I said, wow, I'm seeing the word. Tamiri, because there was three regions called Smaitawi. There was three regions: Smaitawi, Taseti, Taneta. Tamiri is what the Europeans misnomer as Egypt. Mm. All right, which is what I call one of my daughters. One of my daughters' name is Tamiri, because I always try to name my loved ones something of our ancestral land, something that relates to our ancestral tie, and then. When I started looking at this other word going towards West Africa, this is how I know that that the ancient Egypt, the ancient Kemetic people from the Nile Valley who went to the Congo and went further west, that area is called Mauritania. Mm -hmm. So I start, because of my etymology knowledge and epistemology knowledge, I started analyzing the words. I said, oh wow. So the word Tamiri is spelt in the form of an anagram, which means if you spell it in the opposite way, in the opposite direction, Tamiri is now known as Mauritania. Very interesting. That's what I said. Morit and that's what I named one of my daughters. So one of my daughters is named Tamiri, and another one of my daughters is called uh, uh, Mauritania. So Mauritania, yes. the Moors, is, how do you connect that with Morocco? Oh, well, all that was a part of Morocco, because the word M-O-R-O -O is Moro, right? Which is Moorish Latin for more, mm -hmm. all right? Um, all that area was a part of Mauritania, all right? But there was, like, different divisions of Mauritania, you know what I'm saying? Like, for instance, if you, if you check out the, uh, uh, a certain group of people, um, like the Akan in, in, in Ghana, they are not, you know, Ghana is like one of the main central sites of the Akan, but the Akan, you find their traditions in Nigeria, mm -hmm. but they're still the same people, you know, mm -hmm. so because of the dialect may be different, doesn't mean that they're not the same people, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying, so the same spiritual, African spirituality is still there, it's expressed differently, but it's the same concepts, so you'll find traditions from the Congo, from, uh, from the Ghana, all in Nigeria and other places like Benin and Uwida, you know, you'll still, still see that these are the same people. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So it's not like, um, and see at that time too, Minister Brown, which people got to be aware of, we didn't really have boundaries. You know, right. the Europeans have created that crap because mm -hmm. there was no such thing as Nigeria. I just mm -hmm. use that as a reference mm -hmm. because the people in that area never called themselves Nigerians mm -hmm. originally. 
Mm -hmm. You know, you had so many different kingdoms in that area. So that's a British, you know, amalgamation of joining people in together and just saying, oh, these are people that uh, are Nigerian. And this is where the war starts. Because then when you start setting up boundaries, then one uh, kingdom starts having wars against another kingdom because of, 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 of the land barriers that was created by the colonialists. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So one side would be British, one side would be French. You know what I'm saying? Because then that became a barrier. Because now we don't want you to speak your native language or your mother tongue. We want you to speak the, col the colonized tongue. So that becomes a barrier. Now, you, you're in an area that I really want to explore a little bit more before you get back into your lecture for today. Yes. Uh, only because our people think that we, uh, and, and you, because Europeans say, uh, Africans sold themselves into slavery, All right. but you're on. Um, you're entering into the division in which Europeans exploited. That's right. And how they were able to exploit it. So, if someone say to you, Africans sold themselves into slavery, how do you make sense out of that so that they understand the uh, more or less the pathology All right. that Europeans. All right. Use to create that yes. scenario. Scenario. I got what you're saying, and I, I, I'm hearing you loud and clear. First of all, uh, the continent and diaspora, and that's what it is, because the Europeans have not conquered and divided us. We were in a diaspora, naturally on our own. Mm -hmm. He exploited the European. That is, he exploited. Africans who were in the diaspora on the continent itself, all right, and there were no borders, mm -hmm. all right, so this is how the European came and infiltrate, but it wasn't an issue where Africans sold Africans, because that was never an issue when Africans did that. It's just that when one family takes over a certain kingdom, all right, they just emerge together, all right. If you remember the movie with Chaka Zulu, which was a good example, mm -hmm. all right, when he recognized that the British was coming in, all right, this is like 1839, that period of time, probably even earlier, when they was coming, the British that is, when they were coming in, Chaka recognized through his military genius and strategy that if I do not uh, galvanize or create what you call as a confederacy of other kingdoms to keep the British out, of Swaziland, they're going to take over. Mm -hmm. All right. So when he started going over to other kingdoms, the other kings in those kingdoms feared because he was such a great warrior that he was going to take over. But normally it wasn't a, a, a selling of Africans and other Africans. They just emerged with each other. That's basically what it was. Mm -hmm. So he himself in the movie, if you can recall, he says he's not coming over to take over their kingdom. He just wanted to galvanize or create a confederacy, and that's what he that's what he did. So that's why the Zulu was so massive and great. Mm -hmm. So he was an excellent military genius because he created a confederacy. Just like over here with the Erico Confederacy. When the Europeans came over here, you know, the different uh, uh, tribal uh, totems had to create a confederacy just to keep the European out. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that was basically the, the, the factor. It wasn't an issue of... Because Africans didn't never have a concept of selling someone. Because in our spiritual worldview, like Donna remember, remember Richard says, and, and, you know, um, Utama Wazo, our worldview, we didn't have the concept of taking another African and selling another African to another African or to a European. That was not a part of African spirituality. Mm -hmm. It never was a part of African spirituality. So that's a myth mm -hmm. that other Africans were selling other Africans. Now, if, if Africans were used for their labor, all right, that's what it was. It was, they was used as a labor force to build something, all right, but not knowing that they was gonna be taken into a, a condition of slavery, all right. That was the same thing that happened to the Indians in India, who was brought over to Guyana, same thing. It was so that they were had work, 
it was like a workforce, labor force. Mm -hmm. So that's what, and so this, I forgot the name of the, the British guy who came up with this name called Cooley. Mm -hmm. All right, that's what he started calling him. He started calling him Cooley. It was a British dude that called these Indians Coolies because of the, of the labor force. All right, so, but again, they were not treated in Guyana the way the African was treated here. They were not treated the same. You see what I'm saying? Because over here, of course, they was raping, maiming, pillaging, you know, all kind of craziness the European was doing in the continent of Africa just as well as they was doing over here. So African never had a concept of selling each other. That that That's a myth, brother. Because mm -hmm. that's not within the African spirituality. Because if, 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 if it takes a village to, to raise a child, this is the African proverb, so where did the selling come in? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? If it takes the village to raise a child, where did the selling come in? So if you start looking at our ancient vernacular of African spirituality, it, it, it doesn't play a role in, 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 our, in our culture. Selling mm -hmm. Africans to other Africans never played a role. So, oh. so that's why I disagree with Henry Louis Gates Jr. when he went to Ghana and he put this, he's on YouTube and he's actually expressing, oh, you know, my ancestors were sold by the, uh, the Ashantis. Mm -hmm. All right, he, he expressed that. So I have an issue with that. Mm -hmm. because I haven't seen him make the attempt to learn the language or have an interpreter to find out exactly what happened, mm -hmm. all right? Because as it was explained, that when the Portuguese came over, the Ashantis were given other Africans for labor, mm -hmm. not for slavery, mm -hmm. because the concept of slavery does not fit into the African diaspora, mm -hmm. all right? So whatever the menial task that you were doing at the time of your culture, is that that's what you were doing. So slavery was never a part of the African diaspora or idiom, you know. So I think that's important to uh, to stress that. Let me ask you this: uh, the Europeans were able to dominate the Africans militarily because they developed gunpowder, they developed weapons, um, and they went into, um, uh, But you gotta remember something, Mr. Brown. This gunpowder was a combination between, from the Moors, trading with the Moors, and from the Chinese. The Europeans technically didn't have that technology at first. Mm -hmm. So, that's where they got it from, the, between the combination of the Moors and the Chinese. So when they started to, because remember, these people were barbaric by nature. So mm -hmm. if this is something that they can use to take someone by force, that's why they were so great at it, because everything with them was with savagery on a beastly level. So, so we can use this particular weapon. Um, when they start learning that this could be a, such a great weapon, they can take this weapon and use the weapon against humanity. But it was a trade at first. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that the European had all along that he developed. He got this type of uh, 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 technology through the trade between the Moors and the Chinese. So when he had gotten that, that technology... What, what period are we talking about? Oh man, you're talking about a period... It had to be around like... The, the 1400s, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere like the early 1400s, you know, you know, between that period of time, you know, you know, so because once the, yeah, the early 1400s, because when they started to develop this type of uh, technology as a weapon, now they can go into the land and they can start because because remember, people didn't have a concept of shooting something at someone as, as a projectile to kill someone. They didn't have that concept. You see what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. so once the European, like for instance, let's go back to Shaka Zulu again. Let's look at the British. They had the mustard gun, right? Mm -hmm. We can use them as an example. So now you had a small group of British. You have thousands of pounds, thousands of who? Zulus. They're going for it. They're getting shot down. But they're still coming because they never have a concept of shooting something from a distance mm -hmm. other than the spear. Mm -hmm. That's see the gun was like the new technology. Right. To the spear or archery or bow and arrow. Mm -hmm. Alright? So it was another development. Alright. But again, 
it's not so much the technology itself, but it's also the, 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 the strategy. Because if you notice, Shaka defeated the British mm -hmm. and he didn't have the gun. Mm -hmm. They had the spears and the, and the archeries and, 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 and the spears. Mm -hmm. That's what they used, all right? But when he was poisoned, he prophesied in his dying of being poisoned by his own family member. Mm -hmm. Speaking about how, because now you poison me, what's going to happen is the British, the white man is going to come in, as they say, and take over that area. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Because his military strategy were depleted. You know, and you would have think that the other Africans would have used that strategy because he brought that strategy to them. You know, mm -hmm. but what killed that strategy is because as has been said in the movie, they send in the missionaries. Mm -hmm. They send in the missionaries because they knew they couldn't get past the military strategy of the Zulus because their strategy, military force was it was beyond uh, British technology of the gun. So since they realized, wow, we can't use the cannon, now we use the religious cannon, which is the missionaries. Mm -hmm. So when they went in there with the Bibles, they started Christianizing them, that's what changed up their whole ideology. And that's how they got infiltrated. You know what I'm saying? And that's when the military gun came in. So that was a strategy that the European used. His first strategy was military, which he lost. But when he started sending in the missionaries, that's what killed that whole society. That did more damage than the gun itself. Because now you're changing up the people's ideas and thoughts. So like John Henry Clark says, what the European done to us is they colonized our God concept. So that's what happened when the missionaries went into Swaziland. They started colonizing the God concepts of the Zulus. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And that's how they conquered them. They didn't conquer them by the gun. The content of the Bible. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask you this, just yes. to get it out of the way. Yes. The Arabs. Yes. I think there's such a misconception. Big misconception about the Arabs. Yes. Who who are the Arabs and how do the Arabs fit into this whole scope? Scope. Thank you, brother. Thank you. First of all, I haven't heard none of the brothers that I've heard, you know, for years passing and during the current events of YouTube or any form of social media or lectures that goes on, they have never really gave you a clarity of who the Arabs are. There was only one um, beloved sister who did that, Drusilla Dundee, okay. in her book. Mm -hmm. She and showed you, Kushites. she showed you that the Arabian Peninsula originally was uh, a, 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 a colony of Ethiopians, those were the original Arabs. So when you start reading her material, and there's other material that you can read too as a reference, the invaders who came in and mixed in with the indigenous Arabs who were there, who was actually Kushites, right? Mm -hmm. They don't know that history, the invaders. So there's a history of Arabia that we can talk about that the, the, the so-called Arabs, the amalgamated Arabs, don't know about. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're not doing today is not drawing a line between the amalgamated Arabs, or, the, the, or, the, or, or put it this way, the invaders, not to be confused, the invaders from the north who mix with the Kushite Arabs, and out of that relationship, you had this amalgamated Arab, just like you have in Mauritania. You have, like for instance, Brother Reggie had made a statement at Sarnetta Studios, which was a false statement, because he said, matter of fact, his presentation was, Behold the Pale Arab. And he's saying that the black Moors came from the white Moors. And I said, that's not true. Because, see, one thing I learned about listening to those brothers, and they keep talking about scholarship. One has to really dig deep down into history so we won't make that mistake. Because then what we are doing is perpetuating something that's not true. Mm -hmm. All right? So I'm aware, Minister Brown, is that when the Moors were, had their Moorish empire, 
the Europeans were paying tribute to the Moors. Mm -hmm. One thing that the Europeans were doing when they couldn't pay the tribute to the Moors, which is the finances, like the gold or the silver, whatever that was available, they started giving their women to the Moors. And I think the biggest mistake that happened to us as Moors is we started laying down with those women. That was the downfall. Well, that was one of the downfalls of the Moors is we started laying down with their women, all right? Because the European was giving their women in the thousands. So European women, which is who we call Albions or Miss Nova today as a white woman, they were in the thousands of Moorish harems. Just like you see King Solomon in the Bible who had all his harems, mm -hmm. where the Moors were living out the same life of King Solomon. So they had thousands and thousands of women. So when the Moors went up into Europe, they slept with all these European women. That's why when you see that movie um, by Christopher Walken and um, Christopher Walken and um, Dennis Hopper, um, in that movie, True Romance, right, where the mobster, Christopher Walken, was looking for the sheriff, who was Dennis Hopper, his son, because he st stole some money from the mob, from the Sicilian mob. And of course, Christopher Walker was the lead uh, actor in that movie. When they had found him up in the trailer, because the, the, the father, who was the sheriff, who was looking for his son, because the son went off to go get married to some other chick, the father was inside the trailer looking for his son. The mobster, was led to that same trailer. So when they came into the trailer, they seen the sheriff in the trailer. So they pulled a gun out on him and said, listen, we're looking for your son. He got something that belongs to us. So of course, the sheriff ain't gonna give up his son because they know that they're gonna kill him. So they sent him down into the chair and he knew they was gonna torture him. Mm -hmm. So to end it all real quickly, his life, so he won't be tortured, he started telling the Sicilian about the Moors. He said, you heard of the Moors, right? You see, so, he, you know, they were trying to figure out what he was saying. And he was talking about how the Moors went up into Europe and they started to procreate with all these women. So he was saying that how the women was blonde hair and blue eye, now they're uh, dark eyes and brunette. Because the Moors had changed up the whole entire race of Europe. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now those who got the dark hair and dark eyes, we call them the amalgamated Moors. Those are the ones who uh, John G. Jackson and uh, Chancellor Williams talking about. Because there was a big argument, if you read Dust Materials going back 30, 40 years ago, mm. the argument was, and most Moors don't notice, and those who are making this comment, like Reggie, doesn't notice. because if, and, this, and this is how I know who's reading who's not reading. Mm. Who's digging deep and who's not digging deep. They're hitting the surface and they're throwing it out there. But if you dig deeper than that, you'll see exactly what's been said. Mm -hmm. Now, if this movie was made, and this was actually was true, that the Moors did rule Europe at one time, all right, it was kicked out of there, those women was given as what they called the booty and warfare. Mm -hmm. They called them, the, when they say the booty, they wasn't talking about gold and silver. They were referring to the woman, the female. Mm -hmm. So when the Moors were sleeping with these women, they created all these, what they would call, mulatto children which the English would say bastards, but they were known as mulatto children. And this is why I love John Henry Clark, because he went into that history. He did a lecture on the mulatto race, which he would say that the mulatto race would play both sides of the fence, which mm. means whoever was in power. So if the European was in power, they operate with these white slave masters. Mm. If, the, if we were in power, they would operate on our side. Just like the Puerto Ricans today. Mm -hmm. All right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? A lot of yeah. them say that they're white. All right? But they got so much African culture, how could you be white? You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. their music and their speech and all that, all is African. Even Jose Pimento Bay showed you that there was over 4,000 um, Arabic words coming from the Moors. So that's why we use the term Moorish Latin or Moorabic because it's just so much of our culture and the language into the Spanish language. Mm. So now it's interesting, Minister Brown, because I always tell people, how come the Spanish-speaking person, and I don't care what Spanish country he comes from, when you say the word more in English to him, he knows what you're saying in Spanish. 
They know the word morena and moro. They know that. Right? Because if you tell, if you go to any, I don't care if it's Mexican, Venezuela, Colombian, you know, you say, you say to them, oh, uh, you gringo or you moro? You say, no, no, me no gringo, me moro. All right? So they know the word. But now here's the question. How come the English speaking brothers and sisters don't know what the word more is? Mm. What is that? Some kind of religion? So I said to myself, well, that's amazing that in the English vernacular, all our English speaking brothers and sisters, they don't know what the word more is. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? But all our Spanish speaking brothers and sisters, they know what the word more is. Mm -hmm. Ain't that interesting? Yes, absolutely. So that's mind blowing to me. Mm -hmm. And the word Maria is a title of nobility for a woman. Mm -hmm. Like they use the word Madame or Lady. That's a title of nobility in, in England or parts of Europe. Mm -hmm. To the Moors, it was Maria. Yeah. It was Maria or Mary. Mm -hmm. And you notice how the Catholic Church took on our Moorish terminology and they say Mary or Mother of God. Mm -hmm. So they recognize that our sister is the mother of God. You see what I'm saying? And so you so we and people who are aware of it in the conscious community see that the Pope is praying to a Moorish woman who they would refer to as a black woman. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because mm -hmm. cause the word Mary is a feminine aspect for the word Moor. That's correct. Or Maria. Mm -hmm. These are titles of nobility for our our beautiful sisters. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So we have gotten away from that vernacular, but the reason why we have gotten away is because the English invaded our vernacular and changed it up. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting because in their dictionary, this is Webster's dictionary, mm -hmm. you got different variations. They got the word more, mm -hmm. black or more, mm -hmm. black, negro, and colored. So you got five variations that refers in reference to our people. Mm -hmm. So but they, they know us as more. Mm -hmm. But then they eventually started creating this caste system away from more to the word black or more to the word Negro and to the word colored. Mm -hmm. So it's just interesting how they do that. And then when you look up those words, you're going to see the relationship with all those words mm -hmm. and definition of Webster. Mm -hmm. So why would the European have five descriptions of the same people? Mm -hmm. That's a caste system. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So that's what that's what caused me to be attractive to Noble Juali. Mm -hmm. Because when I started studying this brother's work, and he says that we are not Negro colored, uh, uh, black Negro or colored, right? So I'm saying to myself, what did that brother mean by that? So when I started studying it, I said, oh my God. Black is the term that the European use, like in the black codes. Mm -hmm. So it's a term of penalization. Who, who did that? Louis in 1685 he started using black as a code of punishment mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. because ethnically we didn't use the word black to describe ourselves right you see what I'm saying right. that's, that's why I love John Henry Clark and his lecture when he says black is not a nationality mm -hmm. he said that he made it clear Correct. but it's interesting that even though he said that our people still did not uh, uh, um, hon uh, harness in into that. They didn't gravitate into that. And, and, and I never heard, no one in that lecture said with Brother Clark, or Elder Clark, what nationality should we declare ourselves? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's why I love Noble Juali so much. Mm -hmm. Because you got a lot of brothers out there with bang on the moors, but they don't seem to realize it had nothing to do with being more. My um, loved ones, try not to use the word family, because the word family means servants and slaves. We never was taught that. Mm. In the fourth edition of the Black's Law Dictionary, in Spanish law, the word family means servants and slaves. I even got a case law on that. Mm -hmm. Mind blown. So here we are mm -hmm. using their language mm -hmm. to describe our loved ones. Mm -hmm. So that's your constant sanguinity, which means they're all within your same bloodline. You see what I'm saying? But we misnomer that as family. So we so fixated with Minister Brown in those, in those words that we can't see ourselves outside of those words. Mm -hmm. Just like the word understand. 
we should never use the word understand. We think that the word understand has something to do with our comprehension. Right. But right. the word understand, the word under means below. Stand means status. When you look up the word stand, it means status. So you're talking about being under some, somebody's authority. So when you hear somebody actually uh, 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 trespass you, they say, do you understand? Do you understand? So, so when you hear that type of tensity of the word, do you understand? Do you hear, miss or uh, mister, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, you're in the front of the court or you're in front of a lawyer or you're in front of a, a police officer and they use that term in that vernacular, we're taking it as I understand, which means I'm subordinate. Because anything other than that, insubordination. Mm -hmm. So they train us with these words on the job. Like I was on my way over here, I was talking to a brother who was in a correctional facility, I'm trying to help him. He said, what's up boss? I said, brother, don't call me that. Look in the dictionary. The word boss means Dutch master. So who do you think took us as property to become slaves? Mm -hmm. It was the Dutch. Mm -hmm. That's how they got New York. Mm -hmm. It was New Amsterdam. Right. And they have the Dutch flag, that orange, white, and blue, which is the same colors of New York Knickerbockers. People's not paying attention. Mm -hmm. We just going right along with European culture, all right. Until the Anglis, the Anglicans went to war in 1664 and 1665 against the Dutch, and now New Amsterdam became New York. It was the Duke of York, so they came with the Duke of York laws that became New York State Constitution, coming from, and he became a king in England. Mm -hmm. So we are under these laws. So when people say, mm -hmm. "Brother, where are you from? You from New York?" I cannot be from New York. Because the, cause, cause the thing that gets me, Minister Brown, that even though we have been Christianized, there are some principles in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the biblical text that is our culture. Because it's been so convoluted, we don't see it. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. There are principles there. It says, honor that mother and father. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to honor your mother and father, you can't say... You're from New York. Because that's not your birthright. Mm -hmm. You follow me? But we was taught that way. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, mm -hmm. uh, where do you live, sir? Well, technically, you live within yourself. Mm -hmm. You don't live in no house or in no car or no place they give you. Because they train us to say, well, sir, where do you reside? Where is your resident? Well, we didn't know in law, R-E-S means thing in Latin. I did, meaning identity. So these people looking at it as a thing, like in the the uh, grammar now, person, place, or thing. So I always say in the in the grammar, why would they put the word person in the same category as places and things? Because the place is a property and thing is a property. One is real property, the other one is personal property. So why would you put the person in the same category? Mm -hmm. So what did it what did it telling you? And here we got these English teachers teaching our young youth this linguistic witchcraft, this fraudulent conveyance of language, which is a federal crime. That's mm. identity theft. Mm. A noun in grammar is an identity theft. Because according to our ancestors' vernacular, we didn't use now. There was no such thing as a noun. Everything was a verb because everything is living. Mm. We express everything because it's living. So we are looking at things in a Disney form from a European vernacular. This is how they captured us. They used the language against us to capture us. So now we become an object. Mm. All right? Now it's interesting because in court, if something is being said that a lawyer doesn't agree, one of the words he says is, I object. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because he's speaking against what somebody's trying to put him into. All right? So I always try to tell our brothers and sisters, Anytime the DA is saying something against your character, that's slander. Mm. But we never, we, don't, we never object to that. Mm -hmm. Because when, 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 the, when the DA begins to start reading the charges, and start talking to the judge, and the judge look at you and say, Sir, how do you plead? Sir, I object. That's slander. That's slander. Mm. Because the DA doesn't know me. That's not my character. That's why it's good to get character references. Mm -hmm. from people in your community. Mm -hmm. The DA don't live in your community. So we can allow the DA to put slanderous remarks by misrepresenting you as that person. 
The same person that's in the Constitution is the same person in the penal law. If the person commit this crime, that's what they say. Well, you're not a person. You, are, you have a persona, but you're not a person. Because they took the feminine A from the word persona and left you with the word person. So when you go to 26 U.S.C. section 7701, right, and they specifically tell you what the definition of person is. I want to pull this out real quick. That's why I like to do PowerPoints. So when we show this to our people, Minister Clemens and Brown, then they're going to see the language that they're using. 26 U.S.C. section 7701. Look what they say. This is what they say. I don't know if you can see that. Yes. All right. You see that? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to read it. Okay. It says here, when used in this title, this is, oh, 26 USC is the tax code. So they're using the Internal Revenue Code as a form of warfare against our people. This is another form of slavery mm -hmm. through taxation. So they use 26 USC 7701. So you'll say to a brother, brother, you a person? You're going to say quite naturally, yes. A sister, are you a person? Quite naturally, they're going to say yes. But this is what the devil say. The devil say that when used in this title, we're not otherwise distinctly expressed or manifestly incompatible with the intent thereof. And look what they say. Look what they say, Minister Clemens and Brown, if you can see from that distance. Mm -hmm. Look what they say. For the definition Go ahead of person. And read, read it for All me. right. It says here, person, the term person shall mean shall be construed, excuse me, to mean and include an individual and a state. You see? Right. You see what I'm saying? They said mm -hmm. state, partnership, association, company, or corporation. So if they take the word person that we learn in grade school, when they use the noun, right? Mm -hmm. What is the noun? They say person, place, or thing. Right. These devils are setting us up to put in the same category as commodities, yeah. as property. Commodities and property. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when Mr. Bay here say that we should not be using nouns, but because the way they have constructed our minds with this poisonous grammar that they use called now and they put the word person in the same category as places and things we can't conceive that because what they teach you in grade school and what they teach you in law is two different things so they're using legal jargon in this society they're using financial jargon in this society so we as a people don't communicate to the elite who's speaking a different language, even though they're using English as the vehicle, but they're defining the word differently. Right. That's called equivocal, which means it gives a, 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 a sort of like a, a, a comparison of being the same, but it's being defined differently. Mm -hmm. So that's why I tell people, that's why you have to study your antonyms and your synonyms. The three mm -hmm. things you have to study in language is prepositions, Antonyms and synonyms. So when a person say, "Brother, um, we, we um, you live in New York," I say, "No, no, I'm at New York." The preposition "at," not "in," mm -hmm. because New York is a corporation. Mm. If you do the research from the State Department here, you find out that New York is a corporation. So the question is, can you, as a man, live in a corporation? It's impossible because a corporation is a fiction. Mm -hmm. So you can't live in a fiction. That's what that movie Wizard of Oz was all about with Dorothy, the Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. All right, when they started talking about the straw man mm -hmm. who wanted a what? Mm -hmm. A brain. Mm -hmm. The lion needed a heart because of courage. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So you begin to start looking at these veritable typologies that represent what's going on in today's society with the language. So now here I just showed you that the word person can be construed or shall be construed as what they say here an individual and we have to be careful with the word individual because one may say oh um but that's me no the word individual that's a financial term that has something to do with your dividend 
if you're making a certain amount of money, uh, an interest on an investment, they give you what you call is a dividend. Mm -hmm. That's the dividend and the word individual are one of the same. How you know what's going on, Minister Brown, check out the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm. One nation under God, indivisible. Yeah, indivisible. They don't say individual. Mm -hmm. So we're not paying attention to these words. Mm -hmm. We're speaking haphazardly using the oppressor or the enemy's word against our own self and against our people because we don't know the language. But it's just so interesting how we can listen to our brothers and sisters who are lawyers, who are doctors, who are judges, who are senators, who are councilmen, who are representatives. Mm -hmm. you, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We are all in this professional position in this society, but we're still using the words as a, war, a weapon of warfare against themselves, against their loved ones, and against others who support them. And don't see that they're using the enemy's language against themselves mm -hmm. and others. They don't see that. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And even our scholars. Because when I started studying this and I said, wow, I'm not trying to take away from Brother Ben, uh, uh, Dr. Ben, uh, Dr. Clark, and others. Mm -hmm. All right? Because these are our teachers. But then we have to reevaluate the words they use. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. In spite of the European. Now, I know what they were conveying to us to bring us up out of this European uh, uh, darkness and bring us into the consciousness of our culture. And they did an excellent job to do that. Otherwise, we wouldn't be at where we are today. Correct. You see what I'm saying? So That's you right. have to pay homage to them, even though the language was European. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Meaning that it's the enemy's language. Mm -hmm. so that you have to express that same language but yet raise the level of consciousness even in that same vernacular. Mm -hmm. But but I thought it was very interesting that John Henry Clark, who's an ancestor, who said black is not a nationality. And, right. and when he said that, I have never heard nobody in the audience mean said in a, in a questionnaire, Q&A, Dr. Clark, what do you mean black is not a nationality? Because all our lives, we were known as black people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. which I was told from my elders at one time those fighting words. They didn't use the word black. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, they was calling you Negro, mm -hmm. and prior to that was colored. But mm -hmm. see, the colored people were the mulatto children of the Europeans who raped our beautiful dark-skinned women. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So then that became a, a, a caste system. Correct. All right, and because the European, because the the rape was so deep. As I was telling my beloved sister Jamila here, as we was coming up to you, we was going through what you would call Spanish Harlem. Mm -hmm. And as we came to the light, we were hearing the African music, which they would call Latino, but it's really African. All right, we can hear it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And the European conquistadors had raped them so hard, you can see the, the physiological uh, 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 features of the conquistador, the conquerors, mm -hmm. on them hard because mm -hmm. they were of our complexion, you know. Which mm -hmm. of course, Fidel Castro had to put a, a stop to that in Cuba. The dark-skinned Cubans, light-skinned Cuban, because I didn't even know what the issue was when we, when we used to watch that television show, Lucille Ball. Right. All right. How they use Ricky Ricardo because he was of the Caucasian persuasion, they put him over a brother who was really the one who was the original Babalu. Uh, you see what I'm saying? Because when mm -hmm. you talk about Babalu, you're talking about the Baba. That's, that's, that's Yoruba. Mm -hmm. The Baba. You know what I'm saying? A Baba Lao. Babalu. Mm -hmm. All right? So you're talking about the African. But now here they are, took the name Babalu and gave it to Ricky Ricardo to steal mm -hmm. the African origin. Because he represents the conquistador. And I love Lucy. You see what I'm saying? So all these movies and TVs, all these subliminals that they are projecting to us today. But back to the Arabs. Minister Brown, the word Arab in itself, Arab, means dog-skinned people. Arab, 
The word Arab means dark skinned people. That's another name, another word of saying more or African. You know? Or Kush. Mm -hmm. Or Kosh. Arab. Because it was the Ethiopians who was the actual Arabs. Mm -hmm. Like and I you know this is true because look at the word Saudi Arabia. Saudi, Saudi, Sud is referred to someone as dark. Arab is referring to somebody who's dark. People with high concentrations of melanin in their skin. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So again, it, it, you can see where every culture, where we were the foundation of that culture, some invader came in and infiltrated that culture with racism by raping the women, lightening up the race, and changing up the vernacular. Even though they may spill, even though they may say, speak Arabic, because the Arabic that the Moors spoke is not the same Arabic that those invaders spoke. Mm -hmm. There's some things they could comprehend, but it was not the same. Different vernacular, just like in Spanish, various different Spanish dialects. Mm -hmm. Each one of the Spanish-speaking people, they pronounce certain words a certain way in Spanish. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Just like we do in English. Some say tomato, some say tomato. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So it, so the language itself is the vehicle, but it depends on the vernacular or how, or the colloquialism of how the language is being expressed. So if you got people from Persia, who's racist against the original Arabs who were Kushites, and then they invaded them and they started mixing their seed with our women, then they're gonna infiltrate their words into our Arabic language. So now I start hearing these brothers make us feel like of though Arabic have nothing to do with us. Arabic is an African language that came from us. That didn't come from our invaders. And it had nothing to do with Islam. It had nothing to do with the Quran. Mm -hmm. All right? Because if it did, then how is it that the Moors took the Arabic language and infused it with Castilian? And they called it Andalusian dialect. Andalusian dialect is a combination of Latin and Arabic. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that kind of Arabic. So now the Spanish-speaking brothers and sisters, they don't know they speak in Arabic. There's over 4,000 words in the Spanish language that's actually Arabic that came from the Moors. That didn't come from the Arabs from Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That racist mm -hmm. fraction. Mm -hmm. That didn't come mm -hmm. from them. That come from us. Mm -hmm. let, let, let me just clarify something. Yes. Saudi Arabia. Yes. Initially, was inhabited by Kushites. That's right. Black Africans. That's correct. And the European mixture, or uh, where did the mixture come I, from? I couldn't Who say. I couldn't say European because that would be a distortion. These were, because at one time there were not. There was no Europe at the time. Correct. All right, so we wouldn't want to mix the demographics mm -hmm. with the ethnicity of two groups of people who identify as separate. So the invaders from the north, like like Hittites, those kind of groups of people. Um, you have uh, the Hyksos, all right, because those people were physically different. Those are the same people that you would hear Samaj, and for DC, you know, mm -hmm. Brother Clark, Dr. Ben talk about how these Hyksos or Hittites coming from the north, coming down into that peninsula and invading that culture and taking over that culture. They amalgamated themselves into the culture. So they became cultural bandits. They took the language. They took the culture and fused it with their own. So now it looks like it belongs to them. But I, I have a problem with that. All right. Because Hyksos and Hittites, all of that, mm -hmm. Babylonians, Persians, yes. all of those uh, biblical reference, uh, representations. True. And the Bible is not, not an authentic All right. book. I mean, you know, all of that. Let me is, share this with you. Is, Let me share this with you. Exist. And I hear what, you, what you're saying. And I know so what you're saying. This history that we're dealing, we're dealing with, with yes. is primarily a biblical Reference. Not necessarily. Let me let me share something with you because I I am very familiar with Walter Williams. What he's saying, 
This is something that people can acknowledge. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Okay. Because then you're going to get lost. Because I agree with what the brother's saying. But one thing that he didn't do, he didn't tell you who it was. He just say it was a myth. They didn't. They didn't exist. Mm -hmm. But let me give you an example. Um, the King Knights, right? Mm -hmm. They did exist because they learned from the, the, what they call as the Egyptians. For five hundred years, Canaan mm -hmm. learned from their neighboring brothers. Mm -hmm. But now, when you look in the Bible, what do you see? You do see Canaan, but guess what else you see? Phoenicia. Now, that's the confusion. Because now you think that Phoenicia is something separate from the Canaanites. Not knowing that the Greeks called the Canaanites Phoenicians. Mm -hmm. There was no such people mm -hmm. as Phoenicians. Mm -hmm. They never existed. Mm -hmm. I teach in etymology that the Canaanites were professionals at, phonet at, at of, um, phonetics. Or phonics, all right. So they were the ones who carried up the ancient Egyptian language up to other areas. Who did that? The Canaanites, but you never know them as Canaanites. You was always known them as Phoenicians. They mm -hmm. say, "Oh, you'll find the Phoenicians in Spain, or you'll find the Phoenicians over there at the, during the time of Hannibal." See, someone else is calling them Phoenicians. That's a Greek word. So that's where the confusion comes in. So now you're thinking, this is Phoenician, this is Canaanite. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what I've learned, this is what I've learned. Because I hear Walter Williams loud and clear. This is a word. Okay. All right. Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. We were looking at biblical references stating that these people didn't exist. Mm -hmm. All right. And so, and I'm going to give you a good example because I hear what the brother is saying. But then, what about the word Ethiopian? Ethiopia is throughout. True. But I've never heard, much respect to the elder, I never heard Walter Williams say that Ethiopians don't exist. It's a myth. I've never heard him say that. No, well, that's true. I've never heard him say that. I pay attention, brother. Um, I pay attention. So now we know Minister Clemson Brown. I can get maps that go back to 15th century. All right. And the Ethiopian Sea is on a European map. I mean, it's the Ethiopian Yes, sea. it was called Ethiopian before it was called uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Right. Yes, I've seen that. And also, Ashwa Crazy, who's a good researcher, mm -hmm. who studied on the Ben. He was the one who brought light to me by saying that the word Ethiopia come from a king in Africa called Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. I was thrown back with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Ethiopia. So now all this time, we thinking the word is Greek. Mm -hmm. you, you know, because they say burnt face. Mm -hmm. e Ethio Ethi burnt and an ops face. Mm -hmm. That's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. But then when I hear crazy, actual crazy state that a king in Africa was called Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. So because of he was being Ethiopia, his whole territory spread it from East Africa to West Africa to the ocean. Right. All right. So again, that's a history that the European is suppressing. One. And two, to me, when I first heard it, it's not Greek. How did the Greek got the word? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I'm not trying to put Dr. Walter Williams in a, in a, in a, in a, in a chokehold with what he's saying, but I can say from my own etymology studies, you cannot throw out the baby with the bathwater because they got to be a point of origin where that word comes from. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. that word would not exist if it didn't come from another word. Mm -hmm. So that is a hybrid word. Mm -hmm. So we have to first say, we can't, so we can't dismiss that word out the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I can't do that. He can do that and get away with it based upon his context of what he's teaching. Mm -hmm. But me being an etymologist and an epistemologist, right, because dealing with etym etymology, you're talking about the origins of words. Mm -hmm. All right? So I can't do what he does. 
by saying, take the Bible, throw it in the garbage. Mm -hmm. That's easy for him to say, based mm -hmm. upon his context. But I respect him in his studies, what he's saying. But if I show you something different, then can you take the Bible back out the garbage and do a review of that they took the words and they start to morph the words to create something else? Mm -hmm. i give you an example. He used the word black. We all use the word black. But where did the word black come from? Should we take the word black and throw that in the garbage? Oh, we will be offended. Just like the Christians will be offended about, talk, about, talk, about taking their, book, their Bible and throwing it in the garbage. Well, guess what? That's a religious offense. What about an ethnic offense? Oh, taking the word black, throwing the word in the garbage? Well, you wouldn't dare say that. But guess what? I might. <laughs> true, true, true. But the, point, but the point is, Minister Brown, where did the word black come from? See, all these scholars out there don't do the etymology to find out that the word, and it's in the book, it's telling you that the word black comes from the word black. The word black was not a European vernacular. They used the word swartz or swarthy. Mm -hmm. That was, those are the Germanic words that they use. Right. All right? Or even sable. Mm -hmm. You know, because we were the sable or swarthy people. Like an, also mm -hmm. a, 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 sw a swagger. Swagger. So black come from a Sanskrit word. Bleg, B-H-L-E-G. That's where the word black comes from. Mm -hmm. So these words morph from one word to another word. So mm -hmm. what gave birth to that word? So, mm -hmm. so, so that's why I have an issue about throwing the Bible. I can't do that. Mm -hmm. That is my reference point to go back in origin to find out what was that word originally before they changed that word. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So let me read something here to give you a good point on what I'm saying. The word is called eponym, E P O. N, like in Nancy, Y, M, like in mom. Eponym. Listen to what they say in definition number one. A real or mythical person, see, mm -hmm. from whose name the name of a nation, institution, etc. is derived or is supposed to have been derived. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, so, I can't take the Bible, throw it in the garbage. I said, no. I have to take it back out the garbage and say, wait a minute, where did his name derive from? It ain't, it ain't, it ain't like, it's just like, it, 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 it never existed. It, it's a hybrid. It morphed over from another word. Mm -hmm. so, so if we begin to start looking at that, you'll say, oh, all right, now I see who's who. Now I see who's who. Because my whole thing is, who's who in the Bible? Who are they talking about? So is the word Pharaoh in the Bible? Yes, it is. Yeah. Dr. Ben talks about Pharaoh from the Middle Natchez, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So should we throw that in the garbage? That's what I'm saying. We can't. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, this like the book of Timothy, rightly divide the word of truth, right? Rightly divide the word of truth. Well, the word etymology, the word etymology, etymon means true, logi means study, right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, if you rightly divide the word of truth, well, that's where etymology comes in. Right? Mm -hmm. So you have to look at those biblical words and say, what, did those, what was the point of origin? What was the original name of those characters? Where did he come from? See, no, see, no one is saying that. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? They're saying, mm -hmm. oh, this is a myth. That's a, well, that's how they create the myth. They took something that was real and created mythological characters out of it. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Just like they took the sun. And personify the sun into this man. But even if they did personify the sun, where did that concept come from? That's an ancient committed concept that had nothing to do with the Europeans. Mm -hmm. So that's that Christianity before Christ that come from the Nile Valley, the Happy Valley. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So what I'm looking at is the literature, you know, the, the, the philology, the philosophy of the literature. So one has to study the literature and say, where did they get this from? So they're creating these eponyms, taking the real and creating something mythological. That's mm -hmm. how I see the Bible. Mm -hmm. Somebody is real there. See, mm -hmm. how could the brother say throw it in the, Bible, the garbage when Dr. Ben, who taught us all throughout this world, that Psalms 104 is from McNaughton. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So if it's from McNaughton, that's an ancient comedic text. Mm -hmm. So you're saying throw the comedic text in the garbage. Mm -hmm. you, you, no, no, you know, uh, almost everything in the Bible, 
you have a Egyptian antecedent. There you go. I mean, all of the concepts. That's right. This is life after death. That's right. Circumcision. That's right. It's all creating man on a potter's That's field. correct. I don't care what it is. True. In the Bible. True. You can find its predecessor. That's right. In ancient Egypt. That's correct. On the walls. That's that right. That was one of the things. <laughs> That's right. That I heard. Came that to church one Sunday and I was preaching. And when I finished, <laughs> I, you know, I... He came up and said to me, look me straight in that minister, Brown, why don't you stop lying to these people? Oh, my goodness. Everybody hear them. Wow. He said, why don't you stop lying to these wow. people? And come and go to me with, to Egypt and learn the truth. Mm. And uh, I was so floored. I, said, I know you was. I said, okay, all right. This guy got some balls. When are you going? <laughs> and he said, August. So I went with him that August and for the next nine years. I went with him mm. every year. So everything, he, he showed me everything in that Bible you can find on the wall. That's right. In the tomb. That's right. In Egypt. That's right. Before. So it's, that's right. Even it's, the cross. It's, it's, the cross is, I, when I seen the cross, that's actually a hieroglyph in stone and, 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 and it represents spirit of divine peace. But the Romans took that and made it a crucible, something of pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. They made it a crucible mm -hmm. by taking a man, putting it onto the cross, and crucifying it by sticking nails and the thorns of crowns on his head. That's what they did with our ancient sacred symbol. I've seen that from crazy. Mm -hmm. so, oh man, the, 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 the quote unquote Christian cross is a hieroglyph. So, so those are the things we have to see mm -hmm. to wake up the reality. But but the European have colonized our God concept, like John Henry Clark said, so deep, brother, that if you was to bring my own beloved members of my, you know, family, as they would say, they would think that they must have been Christian at one time. That culture, that's what they would think. Mm -hmm. They won't see that this happened, been there thousands of years in the BC period where there were no such thing as Jesus Christ at that time. They wouldn't even see that. They wouldn't even relate to that. And when you try to express that to them, oh my God, it's like talking politics. Mm -hmm. Democrats, Republicans. So speaking religious dogma in your household, yo, that's like taboo. Mm -hmm. Mom, mm -hmm. that crossed that you saying that Christ died on, that's an ancient comedic glyph. That means spirit of divine peace. That have nothing to do with a man dying on the cross. Mm -hmm. All right? And then they give you two different vernaculars in the Bible. Because one moment they're talking about a cross, and then, and then the next text they're saying, cursed is a man who hang on a tree. So was it a cross or was it a tree? Mm -hmm. So now you got two different vernaculars going on here. Mm -hmm. All right? So, but what you said was so true, Minister Brown, because Paul, as a reference, not to say that he was a real actual character, but I'm only drawing it as a reference, when he was being persecuted, you know what they were saying, that doing me to the floor? Was he that Egyptian spreading that doctrine? Right. I said, whoa, that's what the Greeks were saying about the ancient Egyptians, that they was polluting the young Greeks with Egyptian philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's that same language in the book Stolen Legacy. Mm -hmm. So I said to myself, it's just interesting that you will find that precept or that concept with Paul's epistles. So I can see how they just took our culture and then forged it into these mythological characters. It's like, it's like taking your whole life and just forging it into a play or to some fictional character. And then they got people believing more into the fictional character than your actual life. Mm -hmm. All right? So that's called today's terms identity theft. Mm -hmm. Don't throw the Bible away. Mm -hmm. That book is identity theft. Mm -hmm. They're stealing our identity. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. And uh, <laughs> you know, uh, come at this. Yes. <laughs> there is so much we got to talk about. <laughs> but I, I think... You know, I, I, I hope we can just take our time. Yes. And we're going to have to do this more than one second. Oh, yes, okay. because it's a lot. It's a now, lot. 
I think one of the ways of getting our people to really see and understand this history and how it has been stolen yes. is to kind of do the dating of the European. Very important. And when the European comes out of the ice, which is probably about 10,000 years yes, ago. Yes, or more, yes. Uh, and by the time they get to Egypt, because even the Europeans agree that Alexander the Macedonian yes. uh, got into Egypt 332 BC. BC. Mm -hmm. So that's their first entry. That's right. Into Egypt, yes. 333 yes. BC, 333 the years, years. Yes. Before. That's right. You know, which and, and, is, and, and I don't and, and, and I don't and I don't say as those would say Christ. You know what I say? BC means before colonization. Before colonization, that is correct. <laughs> that is absolutely correct. I love it. I'm going to take that. <laughs> 333 BC before colonization. Um, and AD means after domination. But I want you to explain. Before that, the <laughs> Europeans had no institution. That's right. Of how you learn. That's right. Their their what was their culture like? Kind of get into that so we can begin. You talking about who the Greeks? The the Europeans. Oh, the period. White folk coming well, out of the Caucasian. Well, first of Caucasus all, mountains. I have a book called Dirt. I should have brought it with me. I just ordered it on eBay. <laughs> I have a book called Dirt, and when you read that book called Dirt, it actually gives you. I wouldn't say the whole uh, history of European, but that was one of their most prominent time um, in their sovereign so-called capacity. Because it's been said that if you took in a bath many more times than the Queen of England, that was considered to be an offense. So you got punished for that. So you only took a bath depending on how many times she took a bath, which means you can't supersede her. So she took a bath one time for the entire year, you, you only can do a bath for that one year. If she did it two, you can only do it two. So you did things according to what she did. So if you took a bath any time preceding her, and that word got out, you got punished. Now it's interesting because, because the filth and the dirt of the Europeans' lively, lively lifestyle is what created the blue blonic plague, correct? Which is the black plague. Mm -hmm. Now, who came up there and cleaned all that up? The Moors. Thank you. And this is what I love about Walter Williams because he was the one who, who was the first one I heard say that it was the Moors who brought the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. They were the original um, Protestants mm -hmm. because when the Moors started bringing literature to the European, because Ivan Vincernema taught me through his material and his research that the Europeans was illiterate. Yes. So when the Moors brought up literature all through up Europe and caused them to be able to read, now they can start looking at that Bible, right? Mm -hmm. And start seeing things differently. So that's when the protests started coming because the literacy or the educational system, because Vincernema brought to my attention that there were 17 universities of, of Moors in Europe, that that's something that we need to study. We need to do the research because that's mind blowing to find mm -hmm. out that our people had 17 universities spread throughout Europe. Those were the only universities. That's right. They started the university system from and the Moors. They that's right. Brought learning. That's right. Into Europe. But I also wanted to talk about the baths when they started bringing in baths to help clean up the European. Because when the Moors was kicked out of Spain, one of the main things they was kicking pulling down was their baths, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Even the baptism system was even different because our baptism, we was emerging in water. But the European, because his filth and dirt, he was just sprinkling them themselves. See mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So their, their baptism system was even different. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So even though we may be using the same words or we express it, but the vernacular of how we did things was not the same because they adopted it from us. So anything that was of the Moors, in horticulture, agriculture, mathematics, science, astronomy, uh, nauticulture, right, map making, right, 
Mm -hmm. Anything of that, they destroyed it. They burnt it because the Catholic Church wanted to control the minds of the people in Europe. Mm -hmm. The Moors was actually liberating them Europeans and cleaning them up. This is the reason why they could be around us today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right? But at the same time, what these Europeans here want to do to us, they want to vaccinate us. Mm -hmm. All right? Why? The, vaccinate, the vaccination has nothing to do with you catching a disease or anything. It has something to do with coming among the European. Because he was mostly around the animals. Mm -hmm. That's why it says in the Bible that the Egyptians seen the Hebrews as an abomination. Why? Because the Egyptians were more like vegan-like, right? Mm -hmm. And they were not into animals like that. Mm -hmm. they, they, their view for animals is totally different in nature. Mm -hmm. They were not living among the animals and doing all kinds of things with the animals. And when you come in, you can smell this dog on you or this horse on you or this goat on you. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, that's why you see the Egyptians constantly hit clean, shaving under their arms. They was into purification. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So when a Hebrew came in with this garment and this beard, you know what I'm saying? And he mm -hmm. got all this animal odor on him. You know, it's offensive mm -hmm. to have somebody come in your house with this odor. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so and I really didn't recognize that scripture until one of the tenants who were in my home up in Long Island because he has a horse and he went to go see the horse and then like maybe like about eight or nine o'clock that night he came in all right and from out of the fresh air but he had that odor on him so when he came in the house it hit me mm -hmm. I mean it hit me so hard that my my eyes was tearing and I mm -hmm. said yo you was around a horse he said yeah I went to go see my horse I said man <laughs> you sure you wasn't sleeping with that horse? Because you just absorbed the odor of the horse. So he had to take his clothes off and go bathe. Mm -hmm. And put the clothes in the laundry and go downstairs to the basement, to the laundry room, and throw that stuff in the laundry mat. Because mm -hmm. the odor from the horse. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, so now I can see what our ancestors were saying, that the Hebrews were an abomination to the Egyptians mm -hmm. because they were so heavily into these animals you know what I'm saying because mm -hmm. that was not our lifestyle that was not our culture you know yes we did raise them you know what I'm saying for certain ceremonies or whatever the situation was mm -hmm. but we were not into them like that like the Hebrews mm -hmm. were yeah because the the, in, in Europe uh -huh. uh, the, the Europeans lived with the animals and, you know that's they right. lived in the same bond, bond with the and animals. They all lived together. That's right. You know, one of the things, and That's I just right. want to throw this in here. Yes. So we, you pointed out so much. But the Moors brought alcohol. That's right. Into Europe, which is That's one right. of the main Key components ways they were able disinfect. to come back. Sanitize. Uh, that black plague. That's right. I think was, That's was right. alcohol. That's right. So I, I, I just want to throw that in there. Go ahead. Yes, tonight. yes. No, no, true. What you're saying is true because they use that as a, as a sanitary. That, at that time, that was Clorox. <laughs> is what you're saying. <laughs> that was the Clorox. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Because like they say, alcohol will kill anything. So, right. So that was the Clorox back in those days. And the other thing is that <laughs> you're really not talking about a long period of time. No. You're only talking true. about what, 400, 500 years? Yeah, period. Uh, That's right. What, what, what period? Moors went into Europe at 7... seven they say 711. 711. Yes, but I think Moors were... Oh, this is what we need to clear up. And I've never known this until I started studying this. The misconception is that the Moors went up into Europe as though the Moors were not in Europe. I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I learned this from Clark and Dr. Ben. Mm -hmm. It gave me a different perception. Because we have to weigh the evidence on both sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I've heard and learned and researched is that the first five kings of Rome were Moors, or what you would call Africans. Mm -hmm. the, for, the, the early church fathers were Moors, or what you call Africans. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So this thing about Moors going up into Europe, I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what I'm saying is that we were 
Moors were in what you call the diaspora. Mm -hmm. But the way the Europeans are writing the book, or some of our scholars was writing the book, they make it seem like the Moors were in like one century in Africa, and they just invaded and went up in there. Mm -hmm. I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Not to say that it didn't happen. We just cannot isolate that and make that the whole history of the Moors. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Not after listening to Clark and Ben saying that the first early uh, Romans were Africans mm -hmm. or the church fathers were Africans. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Look at St. Maurice, who Caesar wanted him to go down to Switzerland and kill them, which he didn't do because he was the defender of the faith. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And now he became the patron saint of who? Germany. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So apparently the Moors were in Europe prior to the Moors, Moorish invasion. Mm -hmm. That was just another group of Moors. So now you had Moors who were Christians. Mm -hmm. And you have Moors who were Muslims. Mm -hmm. And then you have Moors who were of the Hebraic faith. Mm -hmm. So that was never really expressed, Minister Clemson Brown. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. Because I'm always hearing the Moors who was Muslims, 7-Eleven. No, what you're doing is you are trying to galvanize that is Moorish history. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. one particular brother um, named Suwar Sutton Seti on YouTube by Sonetta filming him. He's saying, oh, the Moors didn't come to about 800 AD, that's when the Moors came because 7-Eleven, you know, because the Moors was Muslims. Brother, if you said you said to be Dr. Ben, you misleading the people. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I learned from the same people, John, Henry Clark and Dr. Ben, that the first popes of Rome were Africans. Mm -hmm. The first church fathers were Africans. So, this was in the B.C. period. Rome was in the B.C. period. Mm -hmm. So if it was in B.C. period, why are you putting the Moors in 800 A.D.? Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying, Minister mm -hmm. Clinton Brown? Oh, yeah. So, we, so we're not looking at this history proper. Mm -hmm. It's like we are picking and choosing and then banging on a certain group of people because you have a dislike for them. You're being biased, just like them crackers, mm -hmm. just like them so-called white folks. You're being biased. Mm -hmm. You can't take on their biasness to fit your whole context. Mm -hmm. You can't textualize Moors in that context. You're doing our history a disservice. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is that the European is saying 711 AD. I disagree with that. The Moors seem to be in Europe way before that period of time. Mm -hmm. Because the reason why I'm saying that, how is it that the fact that a, a woman, an African woman, was named Europa? Mm -hmm. So the very name come from an African woman. Correct. So I can't even call them Albion's Europeans. We mm -hmm. just say that as a point of reference. Mm -hmm. Other than that, she, you can't even call them Europeans. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because Europe is named after an African an woman. African woman named Europa. Even you know, if you look at the study the works of Aspar Quasi. Yes. And again, Walter Williams. Yes. You'll see the transference. Yes. Of ancient, comedic. Yes. Principles, thought, practice. Yes. Rat right on and Africans created. That's right. Christianity. That's right. They were. They That's right. built. The, the first Christian church, the Sophia. That's right. Hagia Sophia. That's right. They were the ones who built the Vatican. That's right. All of, this was Af Africans. Africans were the first. That's right. The Europeans have taken over. Oh, that's and, right. And you see exactly. the Pope and, and that's my all, point. all of these people. But they are acting out of what they took over, over. from the Africans who created it. And now you think that it's been white all the time. Who but that, Africans created that whole, the whole system. We, that's my point. You know? That we were because to me, if you ask me, Minister Clemson Brown, and this is probably gonna be the first time you heard this, Europe to me is actually North Africa. Oh, I hadn't looked at it that way. Because Go ahead. look at Martin Burnell's book, Black Athena. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Look at Stolen Legacy. D. Corinth, Egyptian Learning Center, Galatia, Thessalonica, Philippi. Those are ancient comedic learning centers. Mm -hmm. But they took the ancient comedic learning system and put it in the New Testament 
and forged it with Paul. Mm -hmm. So I said, oh, snap. I'm looking at the Bible, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mm -hmm. was all talking about the Levant. They were all in the Levant. Mm -hmm. Now, I never heard no minister or pastor or bishop or evangelist ever put it in this context. Mm -hmm. The Gospel was in the Levant, which they, today they call Israel. Mm -hmm. But the book of Paul was not in the Levant. It was in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. My mom is a pastor. She asks me, sometimes she, 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 we dialogue sometimes, but I try not to get too much into it with my mom's because she's going to feel offended because she doesn't know geography and she doesn't know who's who. She just, it's the spirit of God and it's this and that. So I'm not making mockery. I'm just saying her perception. No, no, no. All right, so just respect to my, respect to my mom because my mom is beautiful people. Yeah. Right, but I just didn't like the fact that the Europeans colonized my mom's thinking through the theological institute that she mm -hmm. went to. Mm -hmm. That's why Ray Hagen, she may listen to him, she may not listen to him. Mm -hmm. But he got serious degrees in that, in that field. But what I wanted to say was, she was mentioned, uh, mentioned in a place in, in, in the New Testament. So I said, oh mom, that's in Asia Minor. So she looked at me like, Asia Minor? Like could, 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 um, Cappadocia. Mm -hmm. If you study the epistles of Paul, because I, ra I was raised up in the scriptures from a child, mm -hmm. since I was 10. Mm -hmm. When you look at the epistles of Paul, the epistles of Paul, those letters are letters to the churches in Asia Minor. He's not speaking to the people in Israel. That was the apostles or the disciples of Jesus mm -hmm. were speaking to them in Israel. Mm -hmm. But when it came to Paul, Paul didn't talk to them. Paul went up to, quote unquote, the Gentiles, the Goyims, as they say. Mm -hmm. So all those places was ancient Egyptian colonies. Those mm -hmm. was institutions of learning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I said, yo, this is deep. Because mm -hmm. I've never heard no one put it in the context or show that vernacular to show that Corinth, Thessalonica, Galatia, all those different places that Paul wrote letters to was all Egyptian institutions of learning. Mm -hmm. Now, where is that reference in that? St Stolen Legacy by George G.M. James. Mm -hmm. that's, where it's, that's where it's reference to that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you read, you be analytical and you try to put two and two together. So when I look at that, I say, yo, the Bible is, in the New Testament is in two parts. The Gospel in Israel and the Epistles of Paul in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. So all this, all this time, because of not knowing geography, she's thinking Israel, not realizing it's Asia Minor. So now you know in the book of Acts, it says, and they first was called Christians in Antioch. All right? Mm -hmm. So Antioch is an African colony. Athena is an African colony. All those are African colonies. Martin Bernal in the book Black Athena, he show you. Mm -hmm. That our ancestors from the Nile Valley went in that area and, 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 and developed schools of learning all in that area. Mm -hmm. So now as I'm saying, oh, now I see why them Europeans is calling the Egyptians white. Now I see why. Because something that I recognize that I really didn't hear too many people say this, and this is among our scholarship. Did you know Minister Clemson Brown? That every single European nation that has a museum has Kemet in their museum? Absolutely. It's not a museum if it don't have Kemet. That's my point. But what did that mean, though? Even if you say absolutely, what does that mean that, there's a, that they have our ancient history in their museums? What does that mean? Because it was really never spoken of, but it was observed. Mm -hmm. But what does that mean? That means that we were there. It didn't mean that the European came down and took from us and brought back. Not to say that didn't happen. The only reason why it happened, because we were there first. So when we was ran up out of there and went back, them Europeans went down there because they see the significance. Because they couldn't really know what those schools were really teaching because they didn't have that type of learning. Mm -hmm. So they had to go back. So now if you look at the book Stolen Legacy, 
What do you see? Plato, Socrates, and his agonist, and his Dagoris. Who are these guys? These are coming from different islands from Asia Minor. I can't say Greek because they're all not Greeks. From Asia Minor, all right, because the Corinthians are not Greeks. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell the Christian ministers that mm -hmm. because they're not, they don't, they're not learned. Mm -hmm. The Galatians are not Greeks. Mm -hmm. Those are different islands in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. And these different groups of guys who came from these areas went down to Kemet and learned at their feet. Why? Because we was there first. We had set that up. Just like the Hagia Sophia. Mm -hmm. It was set up. Right. So the Moors were really like the last of the Africans who brought universities. Those 17 universities that Ben Sertima talked about, mm -hmm. that was not the first time that was brought up there. Mm -hmm. The Hagia Sophia was not the first time that was brought up there. Mm -hmm. Our ancient ancestors from the Nile Valley brought schools of learning in Europe. That's why I say that had to be North Africa. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because that was culturally ours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we was running out of there by those invasions, they took it over and started calling it theirs. Mm -hmm. And started saying that the Egyptians were white. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I said... Why would they say the Egyptians was white? Then I started realizing it. I started realizing because the, we had colonies all through Europe. Mm -hmm. The European wasn't set up like that. Mm -hmm. The reason why he looked the way he looked today because he took over. He, he, he was the cultural bandit. Mm -hmm. He stole our culture in Europe. He mm -hmm. didn't have to go to Africa to steal our culture. He mm -hmm. stole it in Europe when we set it up over there. Mm -hmm. I don't never heard nobody talk like that. No, I, I haven't heard this discussion. Either. So you, you're bringing me something today. You see what I'm saying? Oh yeah. But, but oh, but this is not from me per se. This is from research, looking at the New Testament, looking at George G.M. James, Black Athena from Martin Burnell, mm -hmm. Doctor Ben. Mm -hmm. All right. So what I'm saying is, my reality of analyzing this is coming from various sources that make me see this. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's that's what I'm seeing. Because mm -hmm. sometimes. We can be, as they say in church, indoctrinated, right? Because it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be church to be indoctrinated. You can be indoctrinated in somebody else's theology or somebody's scholarship, and you only see it one way. Mm -hmm. But if you start grabbing from various sources, then you can start galvanizing and say, oh, I see the big picture now. Right. I see the big picture. One time mm -hmm. I was just seeing it as the Moors with General Tariq, you know what I'm saying, from 7-Eleven, ran up into Europe. Jerry Rogers' book is another source. He's, he's showing you these, these Romans who were Moors, mm -hmm. which we know as Africans. Mm -hmm. J. Buck, right, Sex mm -hmm. and Race, mm -hmm. Nature Little Colony. Mm -hmm. He's showing that in his material, in his beautiful journalism of 50 years that he got an award from Haile Selassie. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. so, 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 what I'm saying is, and then Ancient and Modern um, Britain by David McRitchie. Mm -hmm. All right. So when you start reading all this different material and start galvanizing from all the different sources, then you have a different mindset. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So I said to myself, well, wait a minute now. The Europeans were so busy claiming Africa, well, the Africans should be claiming Europe. Mm -hmm. Because we established that. That's our piece of the rock. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? But they ran us about it. Mm -hmm. And we left behind our culture. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we, we we even have to establish that Greece itself was a colony. Yes. Of Egypt. That, that's what I'm saying. And so, uh, when you go back to what was supposed to be the first Europeans, you find that they were Africans. That's right. Uh, like the Grimaldis. So, yeah. And and so on. So all of that, we 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 need to really do this history. From an African perspective. That's right. And um, um, Alephia Santi, I think, did a good job. Beautiful job. With the book, uh, what is it? African uh, Presence Early Asia? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. But the, the, it's not the last book he did, but the one he did where um, Sister Rosalind Jeffries did. Uh, oh, all right. I know what you're talking about. Um, a, a Journey of. Uh, I think it's a journey of African history. All right. I got the book around. All so right. Find it. That's the book. But, That's the book. But it's important 
to do this timeline. Yes. Oh, very because important. Because it, it ain't been that long ago no, that it wasn't. the Europeans just came, came on the scene. Came on the scene. That's right. And then came uh, into power. That's right. But the transition between the African building the church that became the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. With the Rome, because you see that on television all yeah, the time. Yes. And you see all this pump and pageant and everything. But they're just duplicating the Egyptian That's right. structure. That's right. And system. That's right. And, uh, you know. I, look, look, look at the, the Kremlin in Russia. If you didn't know no better, you think that was an Arabian architect. That's true. But that's the Moors. Ah, I didn't know that. Ivan Van Sertima hit me in the head. When, and back in the what, late 80s or early 90s, mm -hmm. he brought out a book called Africa's Presence in Early Europe. Yeah, I got the book. Of the orange looking cover. Yeah. Right? Playing chess. Right. The Moors playing chess. Yeah. So I'm reading. I said, wait a minute. The Georgians in southern Russia, there's a group of people called Caucasians. Did you know those, those Caucasians were Moors? They were Moors. Okay. So you can't even call a European Caucasian. Because the reason why they was called Caucasians, because those Moors were living in the Caucasus Mountain. It didn't have nothing to do with their skin. It had something to do with the region. So do you see how the European turned around and claimed the land? By associating the geographical location with his skin? So in that book, if you got it, I can show I it to it. you. He showed you that the Moors was called Caucasians because they lived in the Caucasus Mountains. Okay. Okay. I said, yo. So the, even the European want to claim that? Because the area, a sea that's in that area is called what? Black Caspian Sea. Yes. All right? So the Moors was even in that area that they don't want to talk about. And the Russians know that we were there. Right? Because they got a drink called Black Russian. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when you start looking at Russian history, you see our history. Russian history cannot be Russian history without African history. It's impossible. Greek history cannot be Greek history without African history. So everything you're saying is true. So I, I, I see that we're so stuck just in Africa, we're not looking at Africa and, uh, and other locations. We don't, we're not seeing that, uh, Minister Clemson Brown. But I'm learning this from our own scholars. Mm -hmm. This is not coming from me. This is what I see. People, we can look, give an example. You have a Bible? Uh, yeah. Nearby? Right down here. Oh, not here. All we'll right. All right. Songs of Solomon. Mm -hmm. Let me give you from up here. Mm -hmm. First chapter, mm -hmm. verse 5 and verse 6. I've seen a dialogue between Zion Lex and Ali Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Ali Muhammad asked Zion Lex an excellent question. Ali Muhammad was examining two verses, first chapter, Songs of Solomon. Verse 5 says, Do, um, I am black, black but comely. comely. All right, all you daughters of Jerusalem. Verse 6, I'm just paraphrasing. Verse 6 says, do not look down upon me because I'm black. Mm -hmm. So the question that Ali Muhammad asked Zion Lex was, how is it that you're using the word black as a positive for the people in verse 5, but as a negative in verse 6? Mm -hmm. So Zion Lex started getting into this English vernacular, which he's incorrect, mm -hmm. because you can't use English vernacular for a translation in so-called Hebrew. You can't do it. It's impossible. But yet he says he's the authority on the Hebrew, which I disagree with him because I'm very heavy into etymology and epistemology because you've got to see things in the vernacular and the colloquialism of the people of that day. And how you know what I'm saying is the parable in the New Testament that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than the rich man to enter the heaven. What am I talking about? Look at the vernacular. Most people in today's modern English today, when they hear the word eye of a needle, they're going to think of sewing needle mm -hmm. because that's just the English vernacular mm -hmm. at this time, day and time. Well, we, but if you've been studying that word within the scriptural context and the Hebrew, they're talking about a doorway. 
Mm -hmm. So the person in the vernacular of today's time ain't going to think that the eye of a needle is a doorway. Mm -hmm. They're going to think of a sewing needle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so you can't take English vernacular and begin to start trying to translate the, the Hebrew to the English and start using English vernacular. That's an incorrect vernacular. It didn't even exist at the time. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So this is what Zion Lex is doing. So I said, so I have not heard him yet give you a, a, a translation without English vernacular. Mm. And that's incorrect. So that's agree with his, so his Hebrew. All right? And technically, it's not Hebrew. It's anti-Kemitic dialect. Why? Because the, the term or the phrase, I am, in Hebrew, they say is Ani. Well, because I learned from Samaj, mm -hmm. right? And others, Ani well, there's a papyrus called the papyrus of Ani. Correct. Huh? Mm -hmm. So I say, wait a minute. So I am is a divine word. Right? Mm -hmm. How I know it's divine? Because if you go to what? Exodus, the third chapter, verse 14. Mm -hmm. Moses is saying to God, what should I say to the people? I am. That I am. am. So is that same I am in verse 14 of chapter uh, 3? It's the same I am in, ch in chapter 1, verse 5? Yes, it's the same I am. Mm -hmm. But guess what they're going to do in the Strong's Concordance? Give you two different vernaculars. Because they don't want you to see that I am is the divine. So how is it, is I need here, but you're going to say that it's Yahweh, um, or they say um, um, Yahweh, right? Or they use the, the syllables. Mm -hmm. Yahweh, ha, ya, ya, um, how was it? Yahweh. Vahe. Mm -hmm. They'll give you the four vernaculars, the four, he the four Hebrew characters. This is what they will say. All right? For I am. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the question is if that's true, then what's the difference between this I am in this scripture context and this I am in another scripture context? Mm -hmm. So now what gives me the insight is the papyrus of Ani. Because mm -hmm. in the papyrus of Ani, he's in the underworld with his wife, Tutu. Right. You see what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. she's wearing all white represents that she's in her spirit realm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Which she's in the she's in her divine mm -hmm. essence or who she is. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So 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 that I am in the Songs of Solomon and the I am in the book of Exodus is the same I am when it comes to the ancient Kemetic texts. Mm -hmm. But what they did is they created a vernacular, two different vernaculars. They want to separate the two. So that's how you know somebody's corrupting the text. But mm -hmm. if I wasn't studying etymology, I wouldn't have picked that up. Mm -hmm. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because I've never heard yes. nobody, yes. I've never heard nobody make that connection, mm -hmm. and not even Zion Lex. Mm -hmm. But they would have an ex uh, 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 a response to try to say those are two different things. I said, well, if they're two different things, well, why is this I am is the same as the word I, uh, you know this um, I am here? You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important. Yes. Let me let me do this because we're gonna have yes more than one session. Session. Yes. We're gonna. Do about twenty more minutes on this. Yes. And then we're gonna close this now and call it session one. Yes. But just let me say that um, the masses of Europeans only became literate in the last what uh, three hundred years after they only became literate after the printed press. Before then, it was really only the church uh, the uh, that. Uh, uh, had any kind of literacy. That it was a monopoly. Be, it was a monopoly. Yes. A small group of people. Yes. So, uh, and, and, and remember now, Minister Brown, you've got to take this into consideration because I was listening to Minister uh, to, uh, uh, Walter Williams and he's right. Everything he's dropping. But I think it's very important that it wasn't all of Europe. It was just only a certain area. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. literacy was throughout Europe. Mm. So mm -hmm. it was only the small group. So this group, learning the literacy from the Moors, was having a jump on all of Europe. Mm -hmm. Because if they bring literacy, mm -hmm. it, it, that, doesn't, that, that, that remind me of what's going on with the school system here. Mm -hmm. who's, who's doing the textbooks? Macmillan, mm -hmm. right? Or McDraw, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're the ones who got the jump on the textbooks here. So they're producing the textbooks to our children. Well, that's what happened in the 1400s with mm -hmm. the Glutenberg, you know, Gluten, you know, 
Right. Printing press. Printing press. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Oh, we got the printing press system. But as has been said, we've been at writing in Africa. The Chinese. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not talking about true, true. literacy in Africa. I'm true. just talking about. I'm talking about literacy in, in Europe, Europe when it started. Yeah, I mean. Yes. But Europeans have been illiterate, uh, literate, I should say, and they all ain't literate. I mean, uh, but but um, it's only been a short time. They talk about the true. Renaissance. When did that come about? True. But that was the first really broad uh, system that Europeans. Uh, began to read and write uh -huh. on a. On but I have a, to be suspect. I, I have to be suspect of that. I'm gonna tell you mm -hmm. why. Because I was listening to Walter Rodney. I mean Walter Williams, Williams. Excuse me. Very intensely on that, because my point is is that we have to look at the various sources because because he did say, which I'm in agreement with, that the Moors was the one who brought the Renaissance. So the Moors brought the Renaissance. It's like whatever the Moors left over. I remember now, look at the time period that he's talking about. Moors, the printing press. Mm -hmm. So now you're talking about the 1400s. Mm -hmm. So the Moors got kicked out of there in what year? In 1492. 1492, correct. So, so again, these Europeans was learning from us. They were learning from us, just like Prince Henry, the navigator. Mm -hmm. He learned his nautical skills from the Moors. You know what I'm saying? And the map making with right. Don Juan. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is that these same Europeans who Williams was talking about had to learn that concept from the Moors. But they left that out. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because I, cause, cause, cause that's where I see the problem at. Because you can't tell me that Moors had 17 universities throughout Europe and then all of a sudden they literally started at this European with the printing press, I mm -hmm. have to disagree with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think what happened is the end of the Moors literacy in Europe began the printing press for them. Mm -hmm. because But but their start came from us as an African people. Correct. That's that's all I'm saying. All right. I no, think that's no, I'm, important. I'm in agreement with that. You, you, and uh, <laughs> and, and we, we'll go back and we're going to deal with some of this because we get a chance to uh, uh, start over again. Yes. But what I want you to do is make some comment and a closing comment All right. uh, as to where we are today. Oh, are beautiful. we in a great time? Uh, is this, uh, how do you see our presence today with the present administration? All right. With the rise of uh, racism, it's always yes. been here, yes. but uh, under the Trump administration. Yes. How do black people fit into this whole scheme, scheme of yes, things yes. and their importance yes. in either saving themselves or saving the world at this time? You know, where, where is our positioning? I was listening to Omar Johnson, and uh, I mean, I have my own view other than his view, but what I love about... Black Panther? No, Pan... African panis, um, panis. Okay, I was listening to him yes. as well this morning on his analysis. Beautiful, and, and and he was in um, in um, London at um, oh Jamila, what was the name of that place again? He was in Manchester. He was in Manchester, right? And in Manchester, he did a beautiful presentation, and he touched on some things that that I teach, right? And what the issue is, Minister Brown, is this. The education system is where the poison starts. Because once we are educated in the European system, then that means we can take our place in various parts of government that the European have established. So that is what they call the boule. So our people is really carrying out white quote unquote supremacy against themselves and against us. This is what's happening. Mm -hmm. So they're not doing anything politically for our agenda, right? It kind of remind me of a young woman who she was going to school for paralegal 
two years. And she um, was referred to me to help her. And she said to me, because this is on, in retrospective what you're asking me. Because I had to show her something. Because a lot of us don't see it. Because of the education system is putting us in this position so that we so that when we're educated in medicine, we don't see the racism in that. We're educated in being a politician as a senator or as a congressman. We don't see the racism in that. All right? It's there. In judgeship, a lawyer, banking, in science. Racism is permeated through all of that. And they teach us that through an education system. And so we're thinking that it's a professionalism that we are earning as a career and not realizing that we're supporting white supremacy. Correct. All right? So that's why I said, I hear what, uh, well, me and Omar Johnson have th the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. I have a different way of looking at it, but the same conclusion. And mm -hmm. so he would be highly respected to see my view that galvanizes with his view from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So back to this young woman. So I'm sitting down with her. And she said to me that her teacher told her to do a term paper on a case law. And she needed to pick out a case law. So you know what I did, Minister Clemson Brown? I said, guess what we're going to do it on, sis? Dred Scott. Yes. Now, I'm going to tell you why I'm saying this. Mm -hmm. Because it, it all galvanized in today's vernacular. Correct. Because when our young brothers and sisters go to law school, they don't teach us law in the vernacular of how it affects African people here in America. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. That's why I love Automatic. That's my man. Because mm -hmm. he talks in the spirit of African people when it comes to that law. That's right. You see what I'm saying? I'm aware of that. Me, matter mm -hmm. of fact, me and him sat on the same panel. I'm trying to get the tape from, from um, Rick Cornelius called mm -hmm. um, Behind the Bench down in Harlem. Mm -hmm. Every third Thursday. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Every third Thursday, uh, Rick Cornelius, he wants to set up a, 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 a Harlem Law Library. So he has this program every third Thursday at this library over by Marcus Garvey Park. Mm -hmm. Right? I think that's what, 126. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a library there, and he uses the boardroom upstairs. Mm -hmm. And he has what you call behind the bench. He has me there. Mm -hmm. As one of the speakers, panel speakers, you had judges, you had uh, lawyers there, mm -hmm. and they was blown away by me mm -hmm. because they can't believe that I've never been to paralegal school. They they can't believe I've never went to law school. So they so they just blown away mm -hmm. because they hear me say things that they never heard in their career or in their curriculum because you're not taught that way. Mm -hmm. So I told them that my school is from on high. Mm -hmm. That's where my school is from. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So as I was teaching this young woman about Dred Scott, I was showing her something that was very pertinent because the Dred Scott case is still in effect to this day. Absolutely. But the European would tell you here and their judicial system that's been overrun by the Boss Association, they would say that the Dred Scott case has been overturned by the 14th Amendment. That's not true. They're still treating our people in that courtroom as though we Dred Scott. That's right. And I, and I was teaching the sister. I, I hit her with a question. Do you know why Dred Scott sued? She said the most common thing that I've heard everybody say for his freedom. And I said, that's not true. Dred Scott never sued for his freedom. Mm -hmm. That was not the reason why he went to court. Mm -hmm. Do you know the reason why Dred Scott went to court to sue for? Um... Dred Scott went to court because... They said for his freedom. That's the common yeah. thing they say. Yeah. But when I bring this, this point out, it shook everybody. He went to court to sue to get free them for his wife and his daughter. Because that dirty, slimy, nasty slave master was molesting his wife and his two daughters. Because mm -hmm. remember, Dred Scott been going back and forth from the slave state, which was New York... Mm -hmm. To the state of Missouri, which was a free state. Mm -hmm. See, that state was the pivotal state mm -hmm. when it came to the politicians of that day. Mm -hmm. You said, why did that became the, the, the uh, pivotal state? Because that was the Missouri Compromise. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So the Dred Scott case was being used in the Missouri Compromise. So Roger B. Taney, the chief judge, made a decision to overthrow the, the political status of the state of Missouri, which was a free state. Mm -hmm. Because they wanted those free states to become slave states. Mm -hmm. Because Roger B. Taney himself was a pro-Southern slave state slave master. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying, Minister Brown, is that this whole issue was the turning point for Missouri compromise was the Dred Scott case because Missouri compromise happened before Dred Scott case. But when his case came in, to, in because of the fact that his wife and two daughters were being molested, he sued so that way he gained freedom for his family. Mm -hmm. This was not something for himself personally. Mm -hmm. He wanted his children and his wife to become free away from that nasty slave master. That's what mm -hmm. that was about. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't talk about it in that vernacular. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even realize it in that vernacular at first. I just hearing it and going along with what everybody else was saying until I opened up the books and I started reading those 300 something page case law. And I said, oh man, that's why this brother sued? He sued for the freedom of his family, not because he was suing for his freedom, because if that, because if it was, if it was for his freedom, is what people kept saying, and that's what the European in his textbook would make you believe that he was suing for his freedom. You being misled. You so you know how you know for a fact you being misled because the man's um service was contract back and forward, back and forward, back and forward. So how, how could it be for his freedom? Mm -hmm. The man was making money just like the slave master was making money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why would he want to sue for his freedom if you're making money? Mm -hmm. You know. You go on to work. You getting paid. You being contracted out to do the work. Mm -hmm. So why would you want to free yourself from that mm -hmm. if you're getting paid? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? No, I, I follow you. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. I think that's important mm -hmm. because people are saying things and not reading the, the, the context and mm -hmm. what actually really happened. And then the European is misleading people. Mm -hmm. So we go along with that, just like the three-fifths. I was under the impression when they talked about three-fifths, I'm thinking they talk about us being three-fifths of a man. Mm -hmm. That's what the perception that I was with many years ago. But then I did the research. I said, oh, I see what's going on. They took us as three-fifths into their population so they can have appropriation of monies. Mm -hmm. That three-fifths was based upon censorship to distribute monies to their society. Why? Because if those states were smaller in population, they wouldn't have gotten enough money to sustain them in that state, as opposed to a larger population in another state. Mm -hmm. So they took us and joined our population of three-fifths onto their population. Mm -hmm. So they got paid off for us, mm -hmm. but we never got any of those monies. Correct. So that should have been the reparation. And even to this day, we still didn't get that money. But at the same time, Lincoln had the audacity to give those states bonds at six percent interest, can you imagine? Yes. Hey. Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, gave those states bonds to satisfy the Fifth Amendment, mm -hmm. because the Fifth Amendment specifically said that you cannot take private property without just the compensation. Mm -hmm. So when they was emancipating us, well, this dictionary of etym etymology tell you what the word emancipation mean, because most of our people didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. Emancipate don't mean freedom. Mm -hmm. It means to be transferred or delivered up as property. Mm -hmm. That's what it says here in this dictionary. Mm -hmm. And that's what they did. So once our people was up under the state authority as property and under the Civil War, we was transferred from the state to the federal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, for, so to give the states just compensation, Lincoln gave those bonds. Mm -hmm. Right? So the worst thing that ever happened to our people was the 14th Amendment. Mm. 14th Amendment put us back into slavery. Mm -hmm. But they tell you the 13th Amendment was supposed to take us out of that. Mm -hmm. But it was the executive will of Lincoln in 1862, right? Because that executive will, Minister Brown, was a will after the Moors or African people here in this land fought in the Civil War on both sides, the Confederate and the Union. And Lincoln, as a result of his executive will, um, said that we needed to be free. It wasn't the, the, the 13th Amendment. The 13th Amendment came in 1865. Mm -hmm. 
Lincoln's executive will was in 1862. He already had an executive order to free us up. Mm -hmm. So you so you say, but well, what is what is this 1865 did with the 13th Amendment? What's that all about? That was Congress. Mm -hmm. As far as Congress is concerned, we were still slaves. Mm -hmm. But the executive will of 1862 said that we was free because we fought in the Civil War. So we fought for our freedom. So, so Lincoln's executive will was a result of us fighting in that, in that Civil War. So we fought for our freedom. Nobody's talking about it in that, in that vernacular. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the 14th Amendment put us back into slavery. So again, the 14th Amendment was nothing but the, circum the recircumvention of the 13th Amendment. But then what these devils did, Minister Clemens and Brown, they would say that slavery, nor slavery, or involuntary servitude, and then they put a, a, an exception clause. Yeah, for a crime. For so you know what I say? So if you're saying for a crime, so what crime did we commit prior to that? Mm -hmm. Nobody looking at it like that. How are you going to use an exception clause for crime? Because if you're saying except for a crime, so what was it before that? Are you saying that we was criminals? Yes. They're still saying that we was criminals. Mm -hmm. So now you still use the life of a criminal, criminal and, and put it in as an exception clause. And then turn around and say, we're going to make these Negroes citizens. So that's why I showed you under the internal revenue. They're using us as though we are still commodities under mm -hmm. the internal revenue. Mm -hmm. All right? Because I showed you the word person under 26 U.S.C. section 7701. Mm -hmm. How they can screw person as mean an estate and a trust, an individual, an association, corporation. All right? They're not even looking at your humanity. Where is your humanity in that statute? Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. They're not talking about your humanity. To me, 26 U.S.C. section 7701, brother, is a crime against humanity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's going on to this day. Mm -hmm. So our brothers and sisters who are senators, congressmen, representatives, right, mm -hmm. Minister Clemson Brown, mm -hmm. are supporting white supremacy. Mm -hmm. That whole governmental structure represents white supremacy. All right, and until we, as a people, do for ourselves and separate ourselves, because even it says. We need to separate ourselves and come from among the unclean thing. We are living in an unclean Our people are enjoying themselves in it. Mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of suffering with the righteous, they rather enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Because mm -hmm. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. you, you, you vote these people in, but the masses of people who don't know, Minister Clemson Brown, don't know that they are voting these people in at their own detriment. Mm -hmm. We're not politically representing ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna take this up. Yes. That's where we left off. Yes. We want to begin this, and we're gonna throw into this uh, the Willie Lynch, Lynch. Oh. papers. Yes. To buttress the Dred Scott decision. Because yes. The Willie Lynch papers mm -hmm. are in full effect. Yes. You know, some people say, well, Willie Lynch never really existed. Whether he existed or not, everything it's the condition in the right existed. Exi and, you know. You, uh, know what, you know what Willie Lynch reminds me of? Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you brought that up in comparison of the Bible. Oh, it's a story. Oh, they might have put it into a poem. Mm -hmm. or an eponym mm -hmm. but they, they use real people to create a fiction this is why I read the word eponym mm -hmm. they take real people mm -hmm. and create a fiction so then they'll say oh that wasn't real do you know what you call that brother that's called mask now you should know what that is mm -hmm. that's African spirituality the mass ceremony so what the European have learned from the African is to create a mask Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So that uh, fiction is the mask. Mm -hmm. And so our people have been captured into that mask to say that never happened. That's really, religion really, is not real. No, no. It is real. What they did is they used that to create a mask on the reality of what happened to erase, to say that it didn't happen. We have to be careful with that. That's witchcraft. That's wicker. 
-hmm. That's fraudulent conveyance of language. Mm -hmm. They're using the Willie Lynch story as fraudulent conveyance of language to say that it never happened. It's called, you know, you ever heard of that term poetic justice? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That's the Europeans' poetic justice to erase that if Willie Lynch never happened, that means the conditions what they did to us never happened. That's what they doing. Every aspect of it. Every that's, that's aspect wickedness. is in full effect. Full today. effect. And, but, and that's what we're going to talk about all right. the next time we meet. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we, we're going to continue. Yes. This. We're on to a, a good road. A good start. So I want to thank you for uh, I want to thank you, brother. Grace in the studio with your presence today. <laughs> thank you, brother. And I look forward to seeing yes. you as soon as you get back here. Yeah, well <laughs> next Saturday? Hey, we got it. Next Saturday. Yeah. You know what I'm hey, saying? Uh, with you. <laughs> if, if she can come. If not, I I I'll come, you know, I you know, I've been listen, I used to live over here. Down in that basement. <laughs>